our watercolor demo video. Today I'm going to be showing you how to do these 12 techniques um, using watercolor. And first off, I'm going to show you the materials that you're going to need today. If you've grabbed one of the watercolor kits, hopefully you'll have all these supplies. If not, these are the things you're going to need. Watercolor paper. You're going to need a watercolor paint tray and a watercolor paintbrush. I've grabbed a few because I like to switch up my brush. Water to rinse your brush in. Paper towel for drying your brush. Also for one of the methods that I'm going to show. You are going to need a crayon or oil pastel or both. Preferably a light color. You're going to need a little tiny sponge, some saran wrap, some rubbing alcohol, and some salt, a pen or a pencil, so something to write with. Write your name and your hour, either on the back or somewhere small in the corner so it's out of the way. And then I need to divide my paper into 12 squares. So I'm going to make a line about halfway down my paper if I'm holding it vertically. I'm going to make a line halfway through so that I have a top section and a bottom section. And then I'm going to split both of those sections into halves as well. And this doesn't need to be perfect as long as we've broken up the paper here. Right, then I need to break each of these rows, each of these four rows, into boxes as well. So I'm gonna draw a line kind of in thirds here, so I don't want my line to be halfway, I want my line um, to break this into three squares. So I'm gonna draw a line, coming down like this. Another line coming down like this, so that each row has three squares in the row. Each column has four squares. Altogether, we have 12 spaces to work in. First technique I'm gonna show is called solid wash. So I'm labeling the box that I'm working in so that I know that this section is solid wash. When I come back to it, I know what I'm looking at. And when you turn in your project, I will know what to look for. Solid wash is basically just a solid block of color. So I'm starting off by dipping my paintbrush into some water here. And we have to activate the watercolor paint with water in order for it to work. So grabbing my paint palette here, and I'm gonna use the water that's on the brush to wet some of the watercolor. And I'm going to create a solid wash. The goal for a solid wash is that you have a nice even color all the way throughout the swatch that you're creating. So I don't want it to be a gradient. I don't want it to be blotchy or darker in some areas and lighter in some areas. I'm trying to achieve just a solid color with one solid value, and that is solid wash. So next I'm going to show a graded wash. And whereas before I was trying to create one solid value, this time I'm trying to show a range of values. So I'm going to start off light and then I'm going to try to turn my light wash into a gradient. And anytime we start off with a light wash, you want more water on your brush than you want paint. If you're trying to achieve a lighter color, you want more water, less paint. If you're trying to achieve a darker value, you're going to want less water, more paint. So I'm getting a lot of water on my brush and I'm just going to dip into a little bit of paint here and I'm trying to create a really light blue solid wash. So same thing as I just did in this step right here, except this time I'm adding more water because I want to create 
a lighter wash. So now to achieve this gradient effect, I need to make one side of my wash darker. So this time I'm adding a little bit more paint to my brush, and I'm just gonna go in on one side and add paint to this one side. And you can see because this little section that I made is already wet, or it's still wet, it's automatically starting to spread itself out along this little swatch here, but I need to help it. So what I'm doing right now is I'm rinsing my brush so that I don't have any more paint on my brush, and I'm just using my clean brush, going back and forth to drag that gradient across this little shape or this swatch that I've made in order to help the gradient look more smooth or have a more smooth transition. And if I decide that I need to darken it up even more, I can just go in with more pigment, less water, darken up this side here, and then use a clean brush to spread this paint along the gradient. So what I'm hoping to achieve here is one side that is darker, one side that is visibly lighter, and a nice even transition between those two values. Next, I'm gonna show the wet on wet method. So these two methods that I just showed were wet on dry. It's where we were applying wet paint to the dry paper. But for wet on wet method, we are applying wet paint to wet paper. So I start off with a solid wash of just water. Now my water is already starting to turn blue, so you might be able to see my water a little bit, that's okay. But I'm basically just starting off with just a solid wash of just water, no paint yet. Then what I can do is I can go in and I can add my watercolor paint to this wet area. And naturally the paint is going to start to spread itself out and move around in that area where I've added water. So the wet on wet method is really good for this almost tie-dye effect. Also really good for if you ever want to create a shape that doesn't have harsh edges. Because if you wanted something that didn't have a solid edge, you wanted more of like a feathered edge, something like this, you can use the wet on wet method. So say I created this area right here. I've just wetted the paper. Now I wanna make a, a square, but I don't want it to have harsh edges like these squares do. So I can go in and paint my square, but because I've used the wet on wet method, I'm not getting any harsh edges, I'm getting like a feathered edge. So that's wet on wet. Next method I'm going to show is called dry brush. Exactly what it sounds like, we are using a dry brush to apply paint. This technique gives you a lot of cool textures, so if you were doing like bark on a tree or trying to show um, like crunchy footprints in snow, you can use the dry brush technique. So I'm gonna use paint that's already wet because as we know, we need water to activate the paint. So I have purple, blue, and green here that already have water in them. The paint is ready to go, but I have made sure to squeeze the water out of my brush bristles just using my fingers. You can dry them off on a paper towel or you can just squeeze the water out. But my brushes are mostly dry. They're damp for sure because I've been using them already, but they're mostly dry. So they will work for the dry brush technique. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm basically just gonna dip into a little bit of my paint. I don't wanna get too much of like the paint that's saturated with water because it's gonna make my brush wet again and then it defeats the dry brush purpose. So I'm kind of getting just a little bit of paint so that I haven't saturated my brush again fully. And then I'm just gonna go in and paint with my dry brush and you'll see I get some kind of cool textures here. And the textures you get is also going to depend, to depend on the brush that you're using. 
so you can play around with using different brushes for the dry brush method. So that's dry brush, really good for texture. The next technique I'm going to show is lifting color. So you can lift color with a paintbrush, you can lift color with a sponge, and you can lift color with a paper towel. Basically what we're doing here is we are picking up some of the pigment off of the paper. So say I was painting and I was like, oh, I'm gonna make a really light wash, right? I'm gonna use a lot of water, a little bit of paint, but I accidentally get way too much paint, right? I'm trying to create a light wash but I accidentally just used way too much. I can actually use a paper towel, just bunched up, and I'm just blotting the surface, and it actually will pick up some of the paint. So you can see the difference here. I was able to really lighten this swatch of purple by using my paper towel to pick up some of the pigment. So sometimes lifting is a method that we use to correct a mistake, but it can also be used to add texture. So I could use my crunched up paper towel to create texture, perhaps like clouds in the sky. And like I said, you can also use your paintbrush to lift. So if you take a paintbrush that has been squeezed out it will want to absorb water. So say I have a really dark area, I can use my dry paintbrush to lift up some of the color because my dry paintbrush is naturally going to want to absorb some of the pigment that I've put on the paper, some of the water that I put on the paper. So I'll show that again. Got this area that I just painted. I'm gonna squeeze out my paintbrush and use the dry paintbrush to pick up some of that paint. So this is lifting color. You're literally lifting the watercolor right off the paper. Next technique I'm going to show is creating texture using salt. So in order for this method to work, you need to have a really saturated area of watercolor paint. What's going to happen is that the salt is going to soak up the water and it's going to give you this like polka dotty texture. It's an example of what that looks like when it's completely dry. So when I create my swatch here, I'm making sure that I have a lot of water and a lot of pigment. You really need a lot of water in order for this to work because the salt needs something to absorb. If the paint is not wet enough, it's not gonna have anything to absorb. You're not gonna get much texture. And then I'm just gonna pinch and pick up some salt and sprinkle it onto the swatch I just made. You can automatically see it starts to absorb some of that paint, some of that water. And then in order for the salt technique to work, you have to let it completely dry. If it looks dry in 10 minutes and I try to swipe the salt off the paper, what's probably gonna happen is there's gonna be some moisture still in the salt and it's gonna smear across my paper. So do not ever swipe the salt away until you've given it at least an hour more for safe measure to dry. What you can do, because there might be salt sprinkled all over your paper now, is you can pick it up and blow off the excess salt so that it's not all over your paper. This one has been drying for about four hours and now I can safely remove the salt from it. Next method I'm going to show is the rubbing alcohol method. So what happens in this method is we are using rubbing alcohol to repel the paint. Rubbing alcohol does not want to mix with our watercolor paint. So it's gonna repel the paint and create some cool textures. So same thing or similar to um, this salt method that we did, we need a lot of water and a lot of pigment for this to work. If there's not a lot of water, 
The rubbing alcohol doesn't really have anything to repel. It's just going to soak into the paper. And you need to make sure it's still wet when you're adding the rubbing alcohol. If it started to dry out, it's probably not going to work. So I'm adding quite a few layers of water and paint here to make sure that it is wet before I try this method. Now you might have an eyedropper, a Q-tip, um, something that you can use to drop the alcohol on to your swatch here. I prefer to just use my brush though. So I dip my brush right into the rubbing alcohol and you can like draw with it almost or paint with it I guess. You can paint with it or you can drop the alcohol onto the swatch and it almost creates these little like bubbles. I kind of think it looks like the texture of a Petoskey stone but you're adding alcohol to your swatch of paint and it pushes the paint away from the alcohol. So you can get some fun bubbly textures. This is what it can look like using good rubbing alcohol. It's pretty cool. All right, next tech I'm going to show is glazing. I'm also going to show at the same time negative painting. These are two techniques that I'm going to have to come back to because they require painting a layer and letting it dry. So we're going to start here and come back to these in a minute. For glazing, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to blend two colors or mix two colors, but I'm letting the layers dry in between. So here's an example of glazing right here. I started off with orange and then I layered three other colors on top of it just to see what different color combinations I could get. So I'm going to start off with a light wash, so mostly water, little bit of paint. And just over on one side I'm going to paint a rectangular shape so that I have room to layer. I still want to be able to see my original colors just for the sake of the demo and then see what they look like after I've layered them. So that's where we're starting with glazing. And then negative painting is where you create a focal point using the negative space. So you're starting off with an underpainting. In this example, my underpainting was purple. And then you leave some of the negative space or the underpainting showing and paint on top of it. And then the area that you leave showing is like your focal point. So I need to start with an underpainting. Again, I want this to be a really light solid wash so that I can layer color on top of it. So I'm just gonna pick my color here, mostly water, little bit of pigment, and I'm just gonna create a swatch that is very light. Awesome, and then I will have to let that dry for a few minutes. So we will move on and come back to those in a few. The next technique that I'm going to show is using saran wrap to create texture. Saran wrap is a really fun one and it's really cool for creating almost like um, the texture like when you look down at a body of water or if you were to look down into a pool. This is what it looks like when it's done and it turns out different every single time. So basically what I'm gonna do for the saran wrap is I'm gonna start off with creating a wash and then I'm gonna take just a really small piece of saran wrap. I want it to be just a little bit bigger than the space I'm working with. So I'm gonna rip myself a piece of saran wrap that's about the right size areas. So you get this cool texture because where the saran wrap is touching the paper, you're gonna have less paint and then it pushes the paint around and pulls it in the areas where the saran wrap is bubbled up. So you get this like cool kind of unique texture every single time. So I'm starting off with a solid wash. This time I'm gonna do a bit of a darker solid wash. I don't want it to be so light because I wanna see the difference in my areas that the saran wrap creates. I wanna see those different values showing up. So in order to do that, I'm doing a darker wash this time a more pigmented wash. 
And then I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna start to crinkle my saran wrap and then place it right on top of this swatch that I just made. And I don't want to move it too much. I'm gonna place it and press it down and I'm actually gonna keep the saran wrap there until the paint is dry. And I'm just gonna keep it there until my paint is dry. And I can move on to another technique. We're gonna do the resist technique next. where you're going to need either your crayon, your oil pastel, or both. And basically, you're just going to draw a design or a small picture, and then you're gonna be painting watercolor on top of it. And what happens is that because crayons and oil pastels are oil or wax-based, they repel the watercolor. So I can go in and I can draw, I'm gonna start off with some, some swirls do some swirls this time. I'm gonna use some of the oil pastel and some of the crayon just so I can see what both look like. I'm just creating some swirls and designs with this. And then I can choose whatever colors I want here, but I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna just create a wash on top of these designs. And you will see that the crayon and the oil pastel resist or repel the paint that I'm adding on top. So that's the resist method. And then finally, before we go back to glazing and negative painting, we're going to show sponge painting. So sponge painting, I'm going to actually show two different things you can do here. One of these processes is additive. For additive, I'm going to be adding paint to the paper using a sponge. And for negative, I'm going to be lifting or removing paint from the paper using a sponge. So I'm actually going to start off with the subtractive method because I've shown lifting before up here. And we used a paper towel for this one, but this time I'm going to use a sponge. So I'm making sure that my sponge is not like rock solid. I want it to be squishy at least. If it is rock solid, go ahead and just dip it in some water and then wring it out so that the sponge is nice and squishy but not like dripping wet. It can be a little bit damp. And I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna start by just creating a wash. Nice dark wash so I can see that pigment being lifted. And then I'm just going to take my sponge and I'm going to press it into the surface and it soaks up the water as I do that. So again, lifting can be used to correct mistakes, but it can also be used to create texture. So this type of lifting with a sponge will give you a different texture than the lifting that you would do with a Kleenex or tissue or paper towel. And then I'm also going to show the additive process of sponge painting. So this would be where I would add paint using the sponge. So I'm just gonna go in with my blue because the blue paint is already wet. I'm just gonna dip my sponge into there and I'm gonna paint using my sponge. Maybe I'm gonna mix colors, I'm gonna get some green now. And this is a really good technique for if you were trying to paint like a tree show some texture. And when you're done using your sponge, just make sure you rinse it out in your cup, squeeze out the excess water so that it's not dripping wet or dirty with paint. And then lastly, we'll go back up to glazing and negative painting. So starting off with glazing, we are gonna create a second light swatch of a different color that overlaps this one. before. I'm going to try yellow this time. So I'm just creating a second light swatch. I'm doing my rectangle sideways this time so that I can see what the yellow looks like on its own and then I can see what it looks like when I layer these two colors. So this is where the glazing is happening is this area where the overlap is. 
I could even try another section as well. So essentially what we're doing for glazing is we are mixing colors through a layering process. So we're not mixing them in the palette, we're not mixing them right on the paper while they're both wet, but we're doing layering to create new colors. And then finally, for negative painting, um, you are going to be using this glazing process, adding a color on top, but you are intentionally leaving the focal point unpainted. to paint a heart or a star or a moon or maybe in this example a star with a moon I'm not going to paint the star and the moon on top of my background paint here I'm actually going to add a new layer and leave the star and the moon untouched because I want the negative space or the underpainting the background layer to be my focal point so you might be able to just go in and paint this on your own, or you might need some guidelines. So if you do, that's fine. Just go ahead and draw where your focal point is going to be. So say my star here is my focal point, and then I'm going to make a moon around it, but I don't think I need to draw my moon out. I'm going to go in and I'm going to grab my second layer of paint. This time I'm using red, and I am intentionally painting around the star because I would love to leave my star orange. I'm using the negative space as my focal point. Make my moon here too. And paint all the way to the edge so that the orange is covered up or your base layer or your underpainting is covered up. So your focal point is the negative area. I didn't draw, or I didn't paint the star and the moon right on there. I painted around the star and the moon. So my focal point was created using positive space around it, but my focal point is the negative space, technically. Okay. I'm gonna leave my saran wrap on here to dry, but basically this is your, your watercolor techniques that you can use on your final CUA. So, I will grade this and give it back to you so that you can keep it on file and use it as a reference for your final. Um, don't forget to put your name and your hour on the top of the handout before you turn it in and you can just turn it into the drying rack to be graded. And that's all I got for you.